And today we are continuing in our sermon series, uh, The Keys to Joy, The Keys uh, to Joy. We've been working through a series as we've been looking at the book of Philippians, working through the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, and we've been looking at uh, what this book is often referred to as the the epistle of joy, uh, as we talk about uh, joy, what it looks like to to have joy, how do we find find joy, and oftentimes, let's be honest, in our life, sometimes we can feel like our life situation can rob us of joy, and I believe a lot of times it's based on how we see our life, how we see ourselves, and so one of the things that we talked about last week was this thing called comparison, comparison, Hopefully you guys have been using comparison not to make you feel bad about yourself, but hopefully to inspire you, to encourage you to be more like Christ. That when we look at uh, those of our brothers and sisters in Christ, they should compel us to be more like Christ. Uh, Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at my weaknesses and I think less of myself. I look at my flaws, I look at my past. And I think less of myself. I I look at things that I've done, things I said, maybe not you, that I said I would never do again, and I do it again. And and I I see where I am weak. I see my flaws. Matter of fact, uh, I say oftentimes that I look at my life as if it's been written over like a a paper that you turn in school, has up a red markings, and all you see is what you've done wrong. We talked about that last week. So today I want to move to the other side of that because sometimes some of our struggle is not just what we see that we have done wrong, but some of us, our mistake is we, we emphasize on what we've done right. To, yeah, yeah, we're going to go there today. Don't worry, guys. I'm going to cover both ends of it. And it actually reminds me of uh, uh, when I was younger. I remember uh, my, uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to be when I was younger, I wanted to be just like my dad. My dad uh, was an athlete. And one of the things that I always wanted uh, that my dad had was I always wanted uh, a trophy. My dad was an athlete. I want to show y'all one of my one of my first trophies that I, I received. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a little, little golf trophy. This one, uh, first one, I came in third place. Yeah, y'all don't have to celebrate my third place trophy. It's okay. I was excited about my third place trophy. It was at a golf tournament. You don't know how many people out there. It might have been five. You don't know. I came in third. I remember I was excited. My dad was an athlete. My dad was a baseball player, and uh, I remember growing up in the house. Uh, he had bookshelves of trophies, bookshelves of trophies all over the house. And every time we moved, uh, all the boxes that we'd have to move would have all of his trophies. And any time I would challenge my dad to anything, he would point over to the bookshelf. <laughs> Say, hey, son, be careful now. You sure you want to do that? I want you to see all of my trophies. My dad's a baseball player. He went to college on a baseball scholarship. So he was a big baseball guy, basketball. And, and I remember the trophy I saw the most. This is the trophy I saw the most growing up. This trophy right here. My dad won. It was just, it's no, nothing special, but it was, it was a, a home run trophy my father won. And he won this trophy the year that I was born. I was one years old. He won a home run uh, trophy in uh, 1984, home run trophy. Uh, and he, he uh, always, I remember this one because I had a picture. He took a picture with me uh, standing beside me, like he's holding me beside his trophy. And he said, son, I've been winning all your life. <laughs> you think you're going to beat me now? And it was this, this idea that, that he put confidence, listen to me, in his trophy. In the same way, I I thought, well, you know, if I have trophies, this this would be proof. Watch this. That I'm good. Hear what I'm saying? I I will will be able to look at at something to say, hey, you know, this makes me good. This makes me successful. This makes me acceptable. I, I did something right. I had a trophy. The challenge with trophies is that when you look at your trophies, oftentimes the person you think about most is you. And, and here it is that what we find in our walk of Christ is that, matter of fact, I believe the most challenging thing that you can struggle with in your walk of Christ is, is not trying to figure out how to put your, your confidence and your trust in Jesus. is really learning how to stop putting your confidence and trust in your trophies in yourself. See, I want to preach a sermon today titled Trading Trophies. Because that's what we get to do when we come to Christ. We actually get to exchange our, our success, our accolades, the things that we've done, the things that we have, have said, listen, this is what makes me good. And so your trophy might not be something from sports. Maybe your trophy is how you treat people. 
you think, well, I'm nice to everybody. You, you hold on to that as a trophy. That's why God loves me. Or, or, or maybe you, you've acquired something. You've gotten a degree. Maybe you're accepted. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your family. Whatever it is, you find different things. You, listen, we all have trophies that we hold on to. When you feel challenged in life, when you feel like someone, when you, when you feel like someone doesn't think well of you, you'll grab that trophy and you'll hold on to it. Maybe it's not with somebody else, but maybe when you look in the mirror and you're trying to decide if you're good enough, you, you'll pull that trophy out. Whatever that is, you'll hold on to that. But, but here, I want to tell you that in the sight of God, your trophies are not enough. Anything that you could accomplish, anything that you've done right, is still not enough in the sight of God. And that if you really want to find joy in life, it's learning not just to learn how to put more of your trust in Christ, but for some of us, it's learning how to stop putting our confidence completely in ourselves. Here's why. Here's why. Because you, with all of your trophies, you still will let yourself down in the area of your life. This is what I had to learn. No matter how good I am, I'm not good enough. No matter how hard I work, no matter how hard I strive, it's never enough for Jesus Christ. It's never enough to get me in the right relationship with God. It's never enough. This is why. Because it's not enough. God sends Jesus Christ, and we can trade our trophies. We can trade what we've done, y'all got to hear me, for what he's done. You hear what I'm saying? And so today, I want you to write this down. Here's our big idea today. Joy is found, here it is, when our trust, our confidence is in Jesus alone. If you're writing this down, underline that word alone. Our trust, our confidence is in Jesus alone. Because listen, whenever you have confidence in anything else, that means the thing that you have confidence in, you're now depending on. Hear what I'm saying? Whatever you have confidence in, you have to depend on. And when your confidence is in yourself, in your confidence is in your past, your success, whatever it is, now you got to depend on you. And you don't have to have this conversation with you, but you have not always been dependable when it comes to you. Okay, no, all right. Let me get to the scripture. That's easier for him, for him feel. Uh, so, so we're, we're picking up right where we left off last Sunday. We pa- talked about comparison. Paul sends uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus to the church in Philippi because he's trying to encourage this group of people in Philippians in the Philippian uh, letter. He's trying to encourage them how to stand strong, how to live out the gospel in their life. And he says, "Listen, now, uh, uh, now I got to call your attention to something that we didn't we didn't talk about earlier because I know you guys want to know about joy, but I gotta I gotta address an issue in the church. And he's trying to address this issue of self confidence, what we would call self righteousness." Yeah, yeah, he's trying to address this issue. And so in Philippians chapter number 3, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11 today. We're going to start at verse number 1. We're going to just read the first couple of verses because Paul now actually gives us really our point number 1 here. He gives us a warning against something, a warning, a warning. I know a lot of times people say, oh, man, a warning. No, that's a good thing. Warning has saved your life. Nobody, you ever seen that warning that says, beware high voltage, save your life? You know my favorite beware sign? Beware of dogs. I don't like dogs. I used to do door-to-door sales. If that thing said, beware of dogs, all right, I'll catch you in the next ride, baby. <laughs> my, my boss was like, Ryan, why don't you just knock on the door and just check for it? No, if it said, beware of dogs, I believe them. <laughs> Here, here's the thing. You have to believe the warning signs. Okay, let me, let me, let me read. Let's read. Philippians, y'all ain't here. You, you'll catch me in a minute. Philippians chapter number 3, verse 1. Let's read it here. Paul starts. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. He says, listen. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. You know why? Because it's about to be a warning. (laughs) So Paul is really saying, hey, I've told you this before. Uh, When I've come to start the church in my letter before, I've given you this warning before. I don't know about y'all, but I I need warnings more than one time. No, no, no. If y'all ask my mama, she'll tell me. She'll tell you. I had to warn Ryan several times. Okay, I'm going to tell you one more time, son. He says, here it is, you got to catch this, because right here in this very first verse, he really carries the weight of the rest of the verse. Rest of the text, he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. It's no trouble to me as it is safe for you. I want you to catch this before I keep reading. Your self-confidence, 
your self-righteousness, watch this church, write it down, is dangerous. Man, I hope y'all see this in the text. He says, it's safe to you that I come back to you again and warn you again. Here's the warning. Here's the warning. Verse number two. He said, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Y'all have heard that verse that those who worship the Lord must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's, it's not about our works. It's about what the Holy Spirit has done in us. Verse 4. He says, listen, though I myself have reason for confidence. Listen to Paul. In the flesh also. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. Man. He says, circumcised on the eighth day. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I am blameless. Here, here's the warning. So, so let me give you some context. Paul, Paul is trying to communicate something very interesting to the church. Paul wants to remind the church of the warning that has been given time and time before. And Paul warns against a group of people that are teaching works and self-righteousness. Now, you got to understand this now. Uh, this is going to get a little wordy here, so, so, so hang on tight. There's a group of people called the Judaizers. These Judaizers, these are a group of people that were communicating to the Philippian church, hey, listen, if you want to be saved, if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to be with the Lord, you have to circumcise yourself. Yeah, I know. It sounds crazy. Uh, uh, y'all y'all, y'all ain't get a picture yet? Uh, <laughs> the Gentiles... Here we are, are not Jewish, so they have not practiced any Jewish customs. And the old law, the Hebraic law said, listen, uh, all children, as Paul says, on the eighth day were circumcised. And these Judaizers are saying, listen, Gentiles, this, this other nation, this other race, this other ethnic group, if y'all really want to be with us as grown men, <laughs> you have to be circumcised. He says, listen, he says, you got to be careful. This is Paul's warning. You got to be careful of this training and teaching of people that say you can do something to earn your way to God. This is the warning. Now, y'all got to be honest. Uh, I grew up in a church not back then, like recently, and uh, I, I heard this language of communication. You have to do this first. This is what we call religion. And if you've been to our, our, our foundations, if you've been to uh, uh, the launch weekend here at Vertical Church, we, we grow, grow, draw a strange, a very strong distinction between gospel and religion. Paul actually calls, he gives these three warnings. He said, be careful of the dogs. You hear this? Be careful of the evildoers and be careful of what? Mutilators of the flesh. He's using this word as dogs, not necessarily like pets or domesticated dogs. We're talking about like these wild dogs that, that bark and bite and are dangerous, that put fear into you. Hear me, church. He says, be careful of these religious people. Be careful of these people that are so caught up in routine and religion, they will fear you into following Jesus Christ. He says, be careful. This is what's crazy. Uh, uh, these Judaizers, these were very educated academic individuals. These were people that were, were pushing the law of God, and he calls them evildoers. Okay, okay. The very people in the culture that would have been considered, listen to me, church, the pastors of that day, the, the spiritual leaders of that time, he doesn't call them good guys. He calls them evildoers. Why? Because he's saying when you put your confidence in what you do to yourself, when you put your confidence in your work, in your actions, when you put your confidence in the things that you say and do, that's evil. Those are evildoers. And he, Paul says, says listen, you, you got to be aware. You got to be careful. Paul contrast this group of people who worship in spirit. He says, listen, the opposite of this, right here in that same verse, the people said, listen, we're not a circumcision group. We are circumcised not because of what we've done to our flesh, but what Christ has done to our hearts. And we worship the Lord in spirit. He says, listen, we put no confidence in the flesh. You got to hear this. Paul says, 
here's the warning. Don't put confidence in what you can do. Don't, hear me, church, you got to catch this. Put confidence in your effort and work. Here's the tough part about this. Our culture has taught us to put all of our confidence in our effort and work. Work harder. Do more. Be better. We live in a culture that does not stop and does not turn off. Why? Because we've been told more, better. If you want more, you do more. And Paul says, be careful. Don't put your confidence in what you can achieve and acquire. There is, I love this, it says, put no confidence in the flesh. So to put confidence in the flesh is to put anything confidence in anything except God. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Okay, let, let me keep moving. It, this is the warning that Paul gives to the church, a warning against putting confidence in yourself. Here's the question. He says, uh, actually says, those who worship in spirit actually glory in Christ Jesus. Another word for glory is boast. Okay. Another word for glory is boast. So he's saying, listen, if you don't glory in Christ Jesus, then who and what do you glory in? Let me give you another way. If you don't boast in Christ Jesus, then who do you boast in? If, you, if you're not boasting in everything in your life being a product of what Jesus Christ has done, then you're boasting in someone else. Okay. If you're not boasting in Christ, then you have to be boasting in what you have done. Here's the thing. If, if I don't want to boast in my failures, why would I boast in my success? Okay, this is something I had to learn because it really freed me. When, when, when I stopped taking credit for all of my problems, it freed me from taking credit for all of my successes. Here it is. If everything can go wrong because of you, then everything also can go right because of you. Okay, let me, let me see if I'm helping you here. Because one of the things I feel like we, we miss sometimes in the church, and one of our biggest struggles, I, I know for me, one of my biggest areas of challenge in my personal walk, or I may call depression, or struggles is this, that I get disappointed <laughs> when my confidence is in me and it doesn't work out. The Lord says to me, Ryan, who told you to put your confidence in you? But, Lord, I thought if I just did this, and, 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 I, and I did these five steps, and, and I crossed this T, and I dot this I, and, and I, I did everything I was supposed to do, and it didn't work, and now I'm discouraged. I'm without joy. Because my confidence was in something that it shouldn't have never been in in the first place. And Paul says, church, be aware. Be careful not to put your confidence in you. What are you boasting in? Where is your, listen church, where is your confidence? Is your confidence in your work ethic? Is your confidence in your talent? Is your confidence in your gift? Is your confidence in your education? Is your confidence in your background? Is your confidence in your ethnicity? Is your confidence in your nationality? Where is your confidence? And if it's in anything other than Jesus Christ, he says, be careful. See, because your confidence is what you depend on. Watch this. And if you're, you, you also be committed to what you are confident in. Here's what I, I learned. Because one of my confidences was in my work ethic. My wife would tell you, listen, my wife would tell you that, that I, I tried to pride myself on being the hardest worker. She'll tell you, up early in the morning, up late at night, trying to, trying to give every bit of effort, trying to pour all I had. But what happens when I have nothing else to give? You know how discouraging it is when you realize I built my life on my effort and my work. And when I have nothing else to give, then how do I build my life? My confidence was in the wrong. Y'all hearing me? 
It's in the wrong thing. I was celebrating trophies of achievement. I was saying, hey, I did this before. I, I, I acquired, I, I worked hard and I, did, I got through this before because it was my energy, it was my effort, it was my work. And Paul says, no. You cannot live a life based on what you do. See, see, here it is. At the end of the day, it's just about this thing called righteousness. See, whatever our trophy is, is what do we uh, put our confidence in? Paul is specifically talking about righteousness. Whatever makes you right, whatever we think uh, makes us, puts us in right standing with God or right standing in the world. This word righteousness is not a biblical word. It's, it's not just uh, set aside for a spiritual thing. No, it's, it's whatever is right and just, whatever makes you feel justified and right. That is your righteousness. You can justify yourself. Some of us struggle with righteousness all kind of things. We justify things we do based on how we see the world. We feel like this is right. This is okay. You don't feel bad about doing certain things. Why? Because you feel like it's, you feel like it's righteous. And, hey, I feel just in this. They did me wrong. I don't have to talk to them anymore. That's self-righteousness. You feel justified in your own behavior. Do you understand what I'm saying? And one of the things that the church is trying to show us right here that the Judaizers, this group of people, are trying to uh, persuade the church to do, listen, in order for you to be just and right in God, you have to do a certain amount of things. And Paul said, that's not it. Righteousness. We are all, here it is, looking for righteousness. So here it is. Righteousness, your righteousness is whatever you think makes you acceptable and valuable. Here it is. Your righteousness is what you put on your life's resume. Okay. Uh, it's your confidence. It's the thing that says, I am valued and I am accepted. See, your resume is your argument. Did you know that? Your resume is not your history. It's your argument. You don't write a resume for your personal history. You need to know where you are. No, no. You write a resume for your argument because you're trying to answer the question, why should I hire you? So let me show you my resume to justify why you should hire me. One of the toughest questions I had to answer uh, in my young ministry, I had a, my, my pastor, my, my bishop, he asked me, uh, we were shooting pool, and uh, I was beating him. So he started asking me theological questions that throw me off. He's an OG. It's a smart idea. I love it. He asked me, Ryan, when you get to heaven, if God asks you this question, why should I let you in, what will you say? And I remember, like, I was like, wait a minute, is this a trick question? Wait, wait. <laughs> you know when your mentor asks you something, like, okay. It's one of those Jedi moments. He's trying to get me to see something wax on, wax off. I didn't know what he was asking me. And here it is. Can I be honest with you guys? I struggled with this, this answer for a minute. I, I, I said, he said, Ryan, when you get to heaven and God asks you, why should I let you in? What do you say? And I start thinking this one time where, <laughs> right? Is that what you like? Is your first reaction? Like, okay, but okay, I did this, and I go to church, and uh, I, I don't listen to this no more, and I, I don't say this stuff no more often. Uh, um, I, I try to share the gospel. Like, and, I, and I started thinking these things, and then the Holy Spirit reminded me, no, that's not how you get into heaven. The right answer is because I believed. It's not because what I've done it's not because of my effort. It's not because of my works. It's not because of my own righteousness. It's because of what Jesus Christ has already done. He has put me in right standing when I believe in him. Watch this, because nothing that I do, nothing that I've accomplished can put me in right standing with God. And Paul says, here is a warning against your own effort and work. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, Our righteousness, some of y'all heard this before, is as filthy rags in the sight of God. That blew my mind. No matter how good I am, compared to what Christ has done, he says, right, that's filthy rags. Y'all ever seen a dirty rag? 
he says, in the sight of God, my best in my own strength is still disgusting to God. <laughs> so why? Would I continue to bring my filthy rag to God hoping that he would accept it? God, I don't even know why I'm here, but I got to say this. See, this is the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is not that God accepted your filthy rags. You got to hear me. The beauty of the gospel is not that God accepted your filthy rags. God will not accept a filthy rag, but what he will do is send his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins to pursue something that is clean and pure and perfect and give it in your place. That's, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why I worship him, not because he cleaned my filthy rag, not because he looked over my filthy rag, but he gave me a clean one in the name of Jesus. So I don't have to work my way to God. I don't have to effort my way to God. I don't have to perform my way to his, his table. No, no, I receive it as a gift. Jesus. See, we're all looking for righteousness. We're all looking for good standing. We're always looking for something that makes us feel like we're better than we really are. The most fundamental human need is for righteousness, and all of us find it somewhere. And Paul goes through the list of his trophies. He says, I'm going to show you. You think these Judaizers are good? Let me show you how perfect and how right I am. Let me give you my resume. He says, it, says though I myself, verse 4 and 6, he says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. He says, if anybody should be confident, it's me. Here it is. He says, verse 5, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He says, so that thing they're trying to tell you to do, that mutilation of the flesh is a play on words. Because the very thing they're trying to tell you to do, Paul says, I've already done it. He said, I've already done it. He said, of the people of Israel, he says, I know my, my nationality. He says, here it is, of the tribe of Benjamin, I know my ethnicity. This is what we got to be careful of, putting our confidence in things that are not in God. He said, I could put my confidence in my works. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I could put my confidence in my nationality, uh, where I'm from, I'm from Israel. I could put my confidence in my ethnicity. Hear me, church. In the tribe of uh, Benjamin. He says, no, no, that's not what I do. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Both his parents, while he was born in Rome, both of his parents were Jewish. So he was of the pure bloodline. He says, listen, if anybody is of the chosen race of God, it's me. Then he says, watch this, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. Yeah. <laughs> he said, if anybody knew the law, he says, I had the knowledge. I had, I, I, kn I know the Bible. I, I know the law. Yeah, yeah. He says, to zeal, a persecutor of the church. There's nobody more passionate than me. Watch this. He says, and as to righteousness under the law, he says, I was blameless. He said, I didn't break one law. Let's keep reading. He says, of all that, if you read in verse number seven, he says, I counted a loss. Oh, man. Paul says, listen, he said, of all the things that I've done, they're, they're worth nothing. My pride in ritual, my pride in relationship, my pride in respectability, my pride in race, my pride in religion, my pride in reputation, and my pride in righteousness mean nothing. All of these trophies that I've acquired on my own mean nothing compared to going to Christ. Here's the question. What's your confidence in? What's your... What's your trophy? See, there, there are three things. I want to give you three signposts. Write these down real quick. These are three signposts that, that are, are indicators that you are headed towards self-confidence and self-righteousness. Here it is. Number one, if you say this, it could never happen to me. It's just not on the screen. Don't worry. You got to pay attention to church. 
giving y'all too much. Y'all keep looking at the screen. Y'all don't look at me. I'm trying to preach to you. You want to watch it? Watch it later. Amen. We'll give it to you. It, it could never happen to me. I'm sorry. I got it on a soapbox. Let me get down. It could never happen to me. You, you ever saw somebody else's sin and said, you know what? I would never do such a thing. That, that is a small indication of your self-righteousness. You're not saying that it, it, it could never happen. You're saying, I would never fall to that. Then who are you depending on? You. It's a signpost. Listen, here's another one. I'm too good for that. Number two, I'm too good for that. That's the second sign. I'm too good for that. One thing, you think you're too good to do something. When I first started my first uh, church job working with my dad, my dad used to have a saying, uh, somebody's got to clean the toilets. Somebody's got to, he used to say that all the time, somebody's got to clean the toilets. Now, what's crazy is we had a janitorial service at the church, so I didn't understand why he kept saying somebody had to clean the toilets. And what he was not saying was specifically the toilets is that you as a pastor, you as a Christian, somebody's got to do the hard stuff. And the moment you think you're too good to do the hard stuff, the dirty stuff, the nasty stuff, you are starting to think more of yourself. You're looking at your trophies and saying, this is what I've done. I shouldn't have to do that. And Paul is saying, I've been righteous. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm of the people of Israel. I'm one of the chosen part of God. Why would I do that? This is a dangerous sign when you start thinking about yourself this way. I'm too good for this. Here, sign number three. Sign number three. When you start thinking something like this, I can do this alone. Self-righteousness. You, you are on the path towards self-righteousness. Now, let me tell you something. These three signs you don't actually say, but you live your life that way. No. See, God kicked me in the teeth when I, I this third one. Because I don't ever say, God, I can do this alone. But the way I live my life and make my decisions, I make my decisions sometime alone. Why do you make your decisions alone? Somebody, anybody, why do you make your decisions alone? Y'all don't want to answer. I'll tell you why. Because you think you know the answer. That's easy. When I don't ask somebody, it's because I think I know. The other night, I went out and picked up some food for my family. Uh, my, my, my lovely wife was asleep. And I had a decision to make. Uh, I had to make a decision, Harvey. I, uh, I could either wake my wife up and ask her what she wanted to eat. Or. 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 After years of experience. After riding alongside, being menu to menu, sharing my food with her after she ordered a totally different dish. I could walk in confidence and say, you know what, I don't need to wake her up. I'll leave my beautiful wife sleeping right there. And I'll go watch this in confidence. Here it is. I didn't say this, but I said, I can do this alone. Only to get home. My children are excited. Daddy's got food. Thank you, Daddy. My wife looks at me. She doesn't say anything, but the look on her face. Her words were, thank you. Her face said, bruh, why? <laughs> here it is. Because I, do you hear self-righteousness here? Do you hear confidence? Watch this. In myself, when I do things alone, when I don't consider God in everything that I do, when I don't submit my prayers to God saying, God, how do you want me to do this? It's a sign of self-righteousness. So Paul, here's the warning against. Number two, Paul says, he calls us to count. <laughs> here's a call to count. So he said, number one, we got to be careful of self-righteousness. Y'all get that? That's a warning. But the thing to call us to do is to count. Now, after all the things that Paul has done, and after all the things that he's done well, and after everything that would put him in right standing according to the law, according to the Judaizers, he would have been perfect candidate for relationship with God. He says this in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Y'all got to read the Bible slow. He says, the value 
Yes, God. Of knowing Jesus Christ is far greater than anything I was born into. It's far greater than anything that I've achieved. It's far greater than any effort or work that I could have done. And Paul says in verses number three, if anybody could be confident in what they've done, it's him. And he's telling the church, y'all, listen, if y'all are better than me, that's one thing. But I know y'all not because y'all not born in the same tribe that I was born out of. And he says, if, if I could count all of this as a loss, this tells you how dangerous it is. Dangerous it is to put your confidence in yourself. He says, for his sake I have suffered the loss, look at the church, of all things. And count this as rubbish. <laughs> in order, look, if you got your Bibles, underline right there, in order. If you got a, if I'll highlight it, in order so that. He has a of laws in order, I love this, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or comes from my works or comes from what I do, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God, listen to me, church, depends on your faith. Thank you, God. It's not what I do. It's not me. It's not how good I am. It's not what I've, it's not, it's not, it's not what I've achieved. It's not how much I earn. It's not in what I drive. It's not where I live. It's not how well behaved my children are. It, it, it's not in my spouse. No, it's in none of these things. It's only by faith. Paul gives his resume. He lists all the things that would make him right, the things that once, here it is, caused him to look in the mirror and give him confidence. He says, all those things are a loss. He, he looks at his closing argument about how good he is. He looks at what society would say of him and weighs it against the glory of knowing God. And he's saying all this stuff is, is, is worthless. And here, here's what I want, you to, I want you to grab about this. Paul says that everything that I have done, I will count it as rubbish. Now, to understand this word in the Greek, um, this word translates to, um, uh, I'm trying to find a clean way to say this, um, uh, dung, feces, fecal matter. Pastor, you got to say that? Yes, that's what he's trying to tell us. He's not just saying it's bad, it's the worst. All of his good Compared to Christ, is, he counts it as rubbish. And what I want you to understand is that if you are going to really pursue joy and put your confidence in Christ, it does not mean that your things have no worth. It just means compared to Christ, they're unworthy. That I can't put my confidence. What's even crazy when I, when I kept reading this, uh, Brian? So first time he says, uh, all those things I count as a loss. He says, and all things. So not just the things he listed in verses uh, 5 through 6, but everything he's ever accomplished. Even the things that he's accomplished for the kingdom of God. The churches that he's planted, the sermons that he's uh, preached, the letters that he's sent, the disciples, that he, they're compared. To knowing Christ, he said, I count all things as a loss. Here's the thing. I kept trying to figure out, like, why does he, why does he count this? Like, really, Paul, why does he count this as a loss? Like, really? Verse 7 says, but whatever I gain, I count it as a loss for the sake of Christ. For the longest time, I struggled. Like, what, what does this mean? I can understand if you're saying uh, Pastor, that my resume, my trophies mean nothing. They're neutral. That's not what he's saying. He's saying they're actually detrimental to me. Okay, this counts as a loss. He said it's a negative. It actually takes away. Okay, let me see if I can break this down. If you, if you purchase something and it sends you, you break even, that's not a loss. What is a loss? When you go in the red, the negative. It takes something away. Yeah, hear what I'm saying? Uh, how do I say this? Your confidence 
in Christ is crippled by your confidence in yourself. Your confidence in self cripples your confidence in Christ. Here's what I'm saying. If, if I hold strong to my trophies and I put confidence in myself, it's hard, listen to me, church, to take hold. Are you seeing what I'm saying? It's hard for me to grab hold and put my confidence in God when I'm putting my confidence in the things that I've done. And Paul says, I have to cast these things away. I have to count them as loss in order, in order. He says it right there, in order that I may gain Christ. See, some of, the, some of us struggle with confidence in God because we have too much confidence in ourselves. See, that's what I believe for many of us is the roadblocks in our faith. I, I, I believe in myself too much. I have too much confidence in my ability. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, man, we're not, we're not going to talk about this. But, but sometimes, some of y'all, I'm going to just say this, try to find the right way to say it. Some of y'all have been encouraged too much. You've been gassed up. Somebody put a bad, somebody told you you're good. And this is the dangerous thing. You started believing it. Ha, hear what I'm saying. And when you started believing it, you stopped believing that you needed a God that was better than you. So now you don't have a reason to put your confidence in God because your confidence is in you. And the weight and the stress of putting your confidence in yourself is unbearable. To depend on you to get you to God, to depend on you to live right and to live perfect is unbearable. I know y'all probably don't say this, but I've said it so many times, I can't get it right. Why do I keep messing up? Why do I keep falling to the same thing? Because you keep putting your confidence in you and not in God. Then you start telling yourself, like I tell I start telling myself something like this. When I mess up, God, oh God, I know he's so disappointed in me. God don't love me. He's not going to bless me. He, he doesn't care. Oh, God. You start. <laughs> when your confidence in you, now you start looking at your failures, and you're distancing yourself from God because of what you think that God thinks about you. Why do you think that God thinks that about you? Because that's what you think about you. I want you to see the danger in your confidence in God. This crippling effect of self-confidence actually is dangerous. Here it is. The irony is this, that those things that previously have been such gain to me, the things that were actually all these things that I put my confidence in, they actually become things that are my worst enemy. Do you hear what I'm saying? The, the very thing you put confidence in becomes your barrier to your relationship with God. Because every time you should trust God about something, you'll go pick up your trophy. Y'all ain't hear me. Every time you should put your faith in God, you'll go pick up your background. I came from good stock. I, I was ready. I know better than this. Every time you should trust God, you're going to pick up your degree. Every time you should trust God, you're going to pick up your career and your salary. Every time you go, you should trust God, you'll pick up what other people have told you about yourself. And instead of picking up and grabbing the hand of the master's hand, you will grab your confidence in yourself. And when what you grab lets you down, there goes joy. Because your joy now is based on what you do, not what he has done. The 
gospel of Jesus Christ frees us from the responsibility of having to be confident in ourselves. Paul says, no, you don't have to work or earn your way to God. Jesus gives us a free path. All we have to do is believe in him. And I don't know if I'm preaching to y'all today or not. Here it is. And this is what you got to understand. Man, I got to go and pass some time. This is my last point. I'm going to give you this last one right here. Life under the gospel is a rejection of our own moral resume. Not only the bad, but listen to me, church, but also the good. <laughs> we think that God only rejects, the gospel rejects our bad. No, 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 no. Hear me. It also Rejects the good. But why? Because the good is still not enough. And you think, this is what I, that I can hold on to my good. Well, Pastor, I finished my degree in four years, and I finished, and I got this, and, and I got this good job, and I own my second business, and, and I was able to pay my house off, and I, I did all these things, and people think I'm well, I'm good, and I got voted most likely to succeed in high school, and all these things. But listen, all your good is still not enough. The gospel rejects your bad and your good. And so here it is. If your good in the sight of God, according to Isaiah, is as filthy rags, you got to let that go. And the only way you do that is to understand the gospel that here it is that your record is bad. <laughs> See, your resume, you put on there your argument. You don't put on there the whole story. Oh, y'all do See, I'm not going to put on my resume how many times I was late at that same job. I'll just tell you, I won, I won employee of the month one time in six years. But those other five years and 11 months, I can't tell you why I didn't win employee of the month. I can't tell you that. Okay. See, God says whatever your resume is, good or bad, it's not enough. So what Jesus does, he exchanges his record for ours. That's the beauty of the gospel. He exchanges his resume for ours. And we get... God, help me. We get to experience relationship with God, not on our own account, but on what Christ has done for us. So here it is. Here, here it is. I'm closing right here. You got to count. You got to count the weight of his trophy versus yours. And you got you to trade them. I got to trade my trophies every day. Listen to me, church. I got to trade them every day. How do I trade them? In the decisions that I make. I trade them every day. Every day. When it comes to my children, I got to trade my trophies. Can I tell you my most recent conviction in trading my trophies? Because like one of the things I'm like, yeah, I've been, I've been working with Wesley for five years, almost six now in a few weeks. I, yeah, for real. And there are times where I stop praying about how to father my son. You know where that comes from? Self-confidence. So sometimes instead of going, I go to God and tell him what he needs to do to my son. Instead of going to God and saying, God, what do you want me to do for him? I prayed that prayer recently and the Lord started convicting me. I, mean, I asked Wesley something like this. I, I, I do this all the time with Wesley and the Lord started convicting me. I'll say this to Wesley. I said, Wesley, what's wrong with you? He'll do something. He'll throw something. He'll bat. Boy, what's wrong? What are you doing? What's wrong with you? The Lord says, stop asking that question. You're communicating that something's wrong with him. I said, what, what, boy, what is wrong with you? You didn't push your sister out of the bed. Talking to your mom like, you're not going to talk to my wife like that. Oh, you don't want to get up. You know it's time to go to church. And I would say, I would just say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? The Lord said, here it is. When I stopped operating in my own self-confidence, the Lord began to speak to me on how to father my son. Self-righteousness is dangerous. It will pull you away. Excuse me, it doesn't pull you away. You lead yourself away following your trophies and the things that you've done. And Paul says, listen, I, God help me. He says, I come and I count it all a loss for the sake. Here it is. I've suffered the loss. If you actually look at this story, it's actually the image of what Christ does. It is a Christian thing to cast down your trophies and the things and make you 
feel better than you are. You know, how do we know this? Because that's what Jesus does. He turns his back on the throne in heaven and comes to earth. His dissension from heaven to earth takes on the form. We saw it right here in chapter number 2, verses 5 through 11. He takes on the form of a servant. often. You see it over and over in the gospel where his dependence is on God. Watch this. And he's the son of Jesus, son of God. He is Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He is God made flesh. And he still depends on God. He still says, God, not my will, but thy will be done. What are your trophies that you're holding on to that you need to let go of so you can grab the hand of God? Paul says, I count it all as loss that I may gain 